of the end time. Greetings, everyone. Welcome to the panel focusing on the Mino Warriors, better known today as the Dahomey Amazons. I'm your host for this panel, Chidemebe and Jacob Brown, and let me guide you through this interesting array of women warriors. So, let's take a look at these Amazons. So, so the way it starts, you might be wondering, what qualifies me to talk about this? I'm an educator at the Smithsonian. I've been an independent researcher of African history for five years. And I have a degree in history and political science. And I have published several podcasts on African history. So I'm gonna start the slide right now and share my presentation with you all. <laughs> so there's me. Now let's start with who were the Dahomey. As long as everyone can see the screen here, they were a West African kingdom that started in pre-colonial Benin. The kingdom started around the year 1600 and officially ended in the year 1904. I say officially because they were defeated long before that, but by 1904, that's when the kingdom was officially absolved by the French. The kingdom was ruled by an ethnic group in pre-colonial Benin known as the Fon ethnic group and they were known for being the eternal enemy of the Oyo Empire of Southeast Nigeria. But what you're here for, and what the Dahomey are most famous for, were the Mino regiments of women warriors. So, how did this come about? How was this army formed? Let's take a quick look at the history of how the Mino came about. They first started out not as a military regiment, but as huntresses. We have no true record of their first founding, but they did start out as famous elephant huntresses. But they were hired at the time by the then current king, Wegbaja to train his own troops. King Wegbaja was so impressed by these women and their skills with the hunt and the fact that they were known to present elephant heads and elephant skulls to him that he said, all right, I want you to train my troops because you are hardy and you are all very aggressive women. But they only played a very ceremonial role in the mid 17th century. But as the year went on, we go to the next monarch long after Wegbaja, Princess Ahangbe. Ahangbe was a princess of Dahomey that was also impressed by these Beto huntresses. When she and her twin brother Akabe were going to war, they formed an elite unit specifically out of these Beto huntresses. Princess Ahangbe herself would lead the army at the front. Her brother Akabe had all the other male soldiers at the beginning of the army, while Ahangbe had all the female soldiers. The cool thing was because they were twins, they looked exactly alike. And Ahangbe would shave her hair so that people would mistake her for her brother on the battlefield. That way, if, and this did happen, her brother was wounded in battle, she would be able to quickly cover for him in the interim. It is at this point that they were renamed the Mino. 
to show that they had an elite status. But when they were in the military role, they were assigned reserve units, acting as a rapid adaptable force because of how quickly they could run, how easily they could hide in the brush due to their experience as hunters. So when we move on to the next slide, we now understand where they initially started. There's no need to talk about the monarchs because that's not what we're here for. We're just here for the Amazons. So before I want to talk about Amazon life, let's talk about some of the most notable battles that the Amazons themselves were a part of. Moving up to 1708, we're at the battle of Ueme River. The Dahomey forces are fighting a group of people called the Uemenu. So the Mino, initially, this was the first true proper battle debut where they were not being used as a reserve troop. The battle was starting to go poorly for the Dahomey. So the Mino were called in to be used as shock troops to go around the flank of the Uemenu army. And they hit them from the left flank and the Uemenu started to falter partly first because of the shock of seeing all these women on the battlefield. And you know when armies get shocked, they rout. So the Uemenu army was squeezed on two sides by the male units and the female units. So they crushed them and squeezed them in between. And then the Mino were actually able to get to the leader of the Uemenu. We may call them a king today, but that's not what the Uemenu would have called them. But nonetheless, the leader of the Uemenu army was killed by the Mino, causing the entire army to retreat. But they wouldn't engage in any notable conflicts where they played a starring role for quite some time. So when they were off the battlefield, they were listed as the battle wives of the king. He wasn't officially married to them, but they did have that royal status and he rarely bedded many of them. Only a few he, would he actually marry. They were afforded so many legal protections and they had many social positions in the royal court because they had direct access to the king and they could act as the king's bodyguards. They were allowed jurisprudence and many judiciary powers, even becoming a police force. They even had small clubs that are similar to truncheons that you would find in modern day England. So that's how they acted as a police force, palace guards and judges when they were not working in battle. But moving on to some other notable battles that they had a star in role in. When we go to the Battle of Ardra, the Mino forces were being used in a strike capacity. Now this was set in 1724, where they had to change their tactics. Instead of being a pincer slide or a shock type, they needed to be sent to set fire to the ancient palace of Ardra. What made the Mino more significant in this is that the Fawn people initially came from Ardra before settling in the Dahomey region. So this is like, say, being from Constantinople and going down to burn ancient Rome. That's the significance of the Mino playing this role in this event. So that's what got them to be feared along the powers of Greater Benin because this force had struck great old Ardra, the former great power in this region, showing that the Dahomey were not to be messed with. But there was one opponent for Dahomey and one major opponent for the Mino that kept beating them at every turn for quite a while, all the way from 1727 to 1729. And that would be the Oyo Empire. The Oyo Empire was an empire that existed in southwestern Nigeria, just right on the border between modern day Nigeria and modern day Benin. And the two kingdoms were often very close. Dahomey initially had a tributary status to Oyo 
because the Oyo Empire was a much larger power. But by 1727, the Dahomey was stopping the tributary payments to them. So the Oyo decided to attack and invade Dahomey. The Dahomey forces were able to try and hold out against the Oyo, but the Oyo had something that the Dahomey forces didn't, cavalry. Why that's significant and why the Mino didn't use cavalry is because of an insect. Yes, an insect. The Sese fly. It's a fly that is very deadly to horses, meaning that most forces in Benin couldn't use cavalry. But the Oyo did not initially have that problem. So they were able to charge a lot of the Dahomey units. But the Mino, being trained as huntresses of large animals, were one of the few military units left alive after fighting the Oyo and the cavalrymen, which allowed them to call upon their skills as better huntresses. And when they were in retreat up until 1729, the Mino were able to successfully use guerrilla tactics to harass the Oyo Empire, which allowed the Oyo Empire to be slowly pushed out of Dahomey, but mostly because the Oyo were losing their cavalry to the same Seise fly that makes it hard to have a cavalry unit in the Dahomey Empire. So once again, the Mino saved the kingdom. Moving on to 1730, this is where we actually have a victory and to show the Mino's ferocity in battle, where the Mino warriors actually routed a much larger army. This was the Battle of Wida, and the male forces were meant to engage the main bulk of the army. But initially, the Dahomey had 3,000 male, 3,000 troops, 2,000 males, 1,000 females. Those females, of course, being the Mino. But the Wida forces, backed by the French and the English, had 15,000 soldiers at their disposal. And yet, the Mino would end up winning. How, you may ask? Well, the 1,000 Mino were split into two units, 500 for the right side, 500 for the left side. So they came around and engaged in a pincer maneuver on each side of the Wida forces, causing a lot of confusion. And the Wida army actually ended up killing more of their own soldiers in the confusion than the Dahomey forces and the Mino ever did. And the aggression of the women caused a lot of routing and confusion. And by squeezing the Wida into a huge choke point, the Dahomey were able to circle around the much larger army and cut most of them down while they were accidentally shooting themselves, literally in the back because they were encircled. The English forces who had been supporting the Dahomey were actually given to the Mino to execute because the English were saying, oh, we didn't actually support this military endeavor. It was just this random captain or general. You can have him. You can have, Miss, you can have Mr. Testerfall and you can kill him all you want as long as you don't stop trading with us. Please, please play nice with us. And that's how the Mino got a scary reputation. But that winning streak would not last forever. Moving on to Imojulu, centuries later in 1845. By then, the Oyo Empire, this large big empire that existed in Southwest Nigeria, had been breaking up into many splinter factions, as happens with empires. The Dahomey were going to war with a, an Oyo splinter group called the Eba, which are a Yoruba subgroup. And when the Dahomey were getting to go to war with another subgroup called the Egbala, the Egba ambushed them at the village of Imojulu. And most of the male soldiers that the Mino fought alongside were extremely decimated with almost only the Mino escaping. So their job was to ensure that the king at the time, King Hezo, survived to tell the tale. So these Mino, took a final stand against an overwhelming enemy force and were able to 
make them pay for every single centimeter of ground that the Eba were able to take. It wasn't long before the Eba were able to overrun the Dahomey forces and the Mino, but the Mino carved their mark to the point that the Eba couldn't push any further because they had lost too many. The Eba had a pirate victory over the Mino, which also again solidifies their reputation. So this required a lot of reforms initially. Gezo, realizing how many Mino he had lost, he, totaling about 1,000 Mino in that one battle, ne needed to realize that, okay, my Mino are clearly my best warriors. They're doing a lot better than my male soldiers. So let me reform my military structure around these women. So they're no longer going to be a reserve force. They're no longer going to be a strike force as they've been doing in a lot of previous iterations. Kezo amassed 5,000 of these women, broken down into several multiple regiments, and their training was upgraded to be a mix of both melee and ranged combat and lowered their initial training age. As we'll get into later, the Dahomey women started being trained at age eight. And they started being seen as more useful and more powerful soldiers than the male warriors themselves. But this will lead to a decline when we go to the next slide. The Mino began to decline because of another great colonial power, the French. Now, what did the French have over these Mino and the Dahomey forces? Well, the rifle ranges for one thing. When the French and the Dahomey forces engaged, the French repeating rifle at the time had a greater range, 300 yards, and needed only eight shots before reloading. The Dahomey only had a 100 yard range and needed, could only fire one shot before needing to reload. So the English forces that had supplied the guns forgot to tell the Dahomey that their guns would be a bit useless against the French with their superior weaponry. So which means that the Mino forces and the rest of the Dahomey forces had to get in much closer to the French just to get a good shot in. But by that point, the French would have had already eight shots in by the time these women would have even come close. And even when the women did get close and they were able to come in overwhelming numbers, which surprised the French, the French had to affix bayonets onto their rifles. And these bayonets had to be 20 inches long just to stop these women because they would come at them ferociously. And the only way that they were able to stop the Dahomey advance from even coming was the French had to have gunboats stationed on the rivers to fire at these women. So one of the first battles of the first Franco Dahomey War in 1890 left 120 Mino dead versus eight French dead. Now that might seem like a huge disparity, yes, but consider the fact that the women were able to get to the French lines despite the range disadvantage and despite the fact that they had gunboats firing on them with very heavy precision. And it took a while before the women even retreated. They had to be ordered to retreat by their ruler. So in the next slide, it gets worse for them. Moving on to Cotonou. So the Mino realized, okay, our guns are currently inferior. So we just have to make rapid mass charges, which is still a bad idea against guns with a great range and bayonet rifles. But they do manage to actually break the fort and breach it at Cotonou to the point that the French had to get into a lot of hand-to-hand -hand combat with these Mino. And even when the bayonets were, weren't doing it, they needed to get their pistols because they couldn't use the bayonets somewhat effectively or use their guns effectively because the Mino were just that ferocious and that effective. But they suffered massive casualties as a result as you'll see in the next slide. So going to get 
going over the military disadvantages that these women had against the French. The French had gunboats. The French also had a contingent from Senegal, a group of elite African warriors and skirmishers and marksmen called the Tiralliers of Senegal. The French had way more advanced weaponry and the French had the diplomatic advantage. Since the Dahomey had been a master and empire, specifically a slave raiding empire, it had managed to garner a lot of enemies. And the French were able to say, we'll support you and we'll send some of our men into battle alongside you to fight these Dahomey. So the enemies knew the lay of the land. They knew the politics, they knew some of the best routes to go against the Dahomey, and they were able to provide the French with military support. So the French did not need as much of a military presence when they had a lot of allied kingdoms helping them to fight against the Dahomey. And that meant that they had a century of intel on the Dahomey forces, which meant that they knew how to battle these Mino and the best way to defeat the king at the time. So moving on to the next slide, the Mino kept failing to attack, to adapt. So even by 1892, when they were charging the fortified village of Dogba, even though it had high walls, as you can see in the image with me, the Mino kept trying to charge and climb up the walls despite all the forces shooting at them, leaving a pile and trail of Mino bodies as you can see in the image. But they did manage to climb the entire wall, but 200 Mino ended up dying in this with only five Frenchmen dead. And I say Frenchmen specifically, not including African warriors. The French eventually destroyed the Mino in 1894. But before that, in 1892, there was the Battle of Adegon. Using the intelligence that they had been able to gather from their local allies in the various kingdoms, the French were able to wipe out 400 of the Mino, which was a devastating amount, considering these were supposed to be the elite warriors of the Dahomey kingdom. And the French had been learning from their mistakes in previous encounters with the Mino and had affixed longer bayonets to their guns, realizing that, okay, they can get past our bayonet lines, so let's just make longer bayonets. So they needed to import more trivaliers, they needed to import more from the places they had already conquered and colonized. So that's how the French got saved because the Dahomey seemed to be able to beat the French or get close to beating the French a lot of times. And the Dahomey nearly got made so many successful raids on the French because the Dahomey liked to attack at dawn when it was dark and sneak up on them. But thanks to the Senegalese trailers and the local forces, they were able to beat back many of these Mino and the Dahomey. So France officially disbanded the Mino in 1894 when the French conquered the capital of Dahomey, which was called Abomey. So as you can see, they're raising the French flag over Abomey and they disbanded the entire Mino units. But in a cool bit of note for the Mino, they were the only African force to deal the most damage to the French colonial expeditions. Because you, at the end of the day, you had 224 Frenchmen wounded, 173 Frenchmen dead, and 52 expensive artillery units that were destroyed by the Mino. And that's not counting all the local African forces that were dis destroyed or dead which goes in the thousands of African soldiers that they imported that were, ended up being dead. So I have to hand it to the Mino. They did a lot of damage and the French had to respect them as an enemy, which is why the French continue to write about them and respect them long after their destruction. So now that we've gone over all the major battles that they've been in, the question is what made them preferable to male soldiers? Well, according to the accounts we have from many European traders who like to visit just to see these women, they said these women were extremely tough, very powerful, and well-built. And because of their time spent as huntresses, 
That made them very aggressive units. Remember, these women started off taking on elephants with nothing but spears on their own. And they, because of this, they rarely fled from battle. And it's extremely valuable to have a unit that doesn't run away from a fight or gets broken or scared. Although you do have the problem of them not having the habit of retreating. So think of Viking berserkers. So they, were, they would have been the Viking berserkers of their day, but they were also very fast and very mobile and they could harass a lot of large forces. And they had a lot of good ambush tactics because remember they used to sneak up on lions, elephants, leopards. If you're able to sneak up on big cats, you have very good ambush skills. But by 1862, most of the Dahomey population as taken in a census were skewed in favor of women. So the population of Dahomey was more women than men, which meant you needed to field more women than men because most of the male units seemed to suffer a lot of casualties before the women got around in previous wars from the 1700s. So women are gonna be your main source. So moving on to the next slide. How, the way they were recruited was that they had, the king had recruiting officials called Fakbas, which would tour the entire kingdom just to find the strongest women. The most beautiful women would go to the king, would be in the king's harem, but the strongest women would be in the king's guard. You also had some female criminals that would join because it would be a better life than jail. And some noblemen even sent their strongest daughters to join these Dahomey warriors to curry favor with the king. Because if you sent your daughter to be in part of this army, the king would actually give you a financial share or financial stocks in the, at the time, slave trade or some other form of financial compensation. And some women wanted to sign up for the army because they would get a much better social station in life. And of these regiments was the Ahonato regiment. And these were made of female descendants of the royal family. Since the king would have a large harem, he would have a lot of descendants, which means he would have a lot of daughters. But since a lot of these daughters couldn't inherit the crown, they were sent to be part of this elite regiment. And they were also made of descendants of previous Amazons. And they were trained from much earlier ages. While the average Amazon will be trained close around age nine to 10, these Amazons could be trained from age six to eight, starting at that young. And they were taught politics and judiciary matters and a lot of them could even have been princesses of the kingdom taking a tenure as a Dahomey warrior or a Dahomey Mino or Dahomey Amazon, whichever you prefer, before settling in as a princess. As for the social ranking, as we talked about before, they were second only to the king in terms of social hierarchy. And each of these Mino had their own slaves. The veteran units had more slaves. The rookie units did not have any slaves, but they would gain slaves the more combat prowess and more notable combat feats they would get. And they had a higher social stature than most men. If you tried to accost one of these meaner women in the streets, you were going to be beheaded. It was going to be a death sentence. And these women could buy a lot of land. They could own farms of their own. They could have so many servants when they were not being fielded into battle. And because they had access to the king, they also had shares and stocks in the slave trade and all the other businesses that the king would economically field. As for the military attire, what we have on display is the military attire from the 1800s, as they had a more Celtic approach to military attire in the 1600s and 1700s, which I cannot show here. So we're gonna stick with the 1800s attire. They had knee length shorts, which were called chocotos, and they wore white cotton skull cap hats with sleeveless shirts that came in variants of blue or rust brown. Darker blue was reserved for the Ahonato regiments because they were the special ones. And the veteran headbands, they came with crocodile imagery to show how skilled they were, that they were as ferocious as crocodiles, while rookies had headbands, 
and there would be a red or black slash around the waist where they would store their swords, their pistols, their poison-tipped arrows, and their many other gear. And the sash was tight enough to even hold a lot of their muzzle-bearing rifles. The weaponry that they used was especially mixed to show how adaptable they were. As mentioned before, they had the smooth bore loaded flintlock musket, which by this point wasn't a very efficient gun, but they also had carbine rifles and blunderbuss rifles, which they all carried with them at the same time. They, had, they were known how to field cannons, which is what made them so effective against the French artillery because they had field artillery of their own. They also had swivel guns. They had mortars. They were trained in the use of mortars. And because they were extremely tough, they could move these heavy mortars around very efficiently. Although the rookies were taught how to use bow and arrows because they started out as huntresses. Though some of these arrows, as the French did note, were poison tipped. So you didn't always have to need a kill shot. You just needed a grazing shot. As for the melee weaponry, they had a hybrid between a machete and a cutlass initially, as you can see in the image. They carried a lot of daggers on them, but the, they had a specific sword that the French actually were very wary of, which the French called the guillotine sword. It was a sword that was 30 inches long, weighed 30 pounds, and was a two-handed weapon. And they called it a guillotine sword because it was very effective at, well, cutting off French heads which the Mino were extremely adapt at, especially when fighting the French in the later years of their war. They had hand axes, which they were reported to be able to throw at opposing enemy forces, but they could also cut them down with the axes. They had the spears, which were usually made of brass that could either be used in a throwing fashion or like a typical thrusting fashion. But when they were not on the battlefield, they had the truncheon clubs for police work. As for their training, I mentioned before that they started at around the age of eight. They had daily shooting practice. They had daily wrestling matches to help build strength. And they were trained, and this part might sound a bit harsh, they were trained to be insensitive to human suffering. They were taught how to torture. They were taught how to mentally break people. Because remember, the Dahomey Kingdom was a slave raiding empire, so these Mino were trained not only how to kill, but to capture and subdue and mentally break someone so that they would be mentally pliable enough to become a slave. So by did this by killing criminals. They would practice ki killing criminals at the age of eight and nine. And even when they became teenagers, they were becoming physically trained to shrug off a lot of damage, which is why the French had trouble when they kept shooting at them and these women kept coming. And that's why they thought they were berserkers because you shoot a, a person in the shoulder or in the chest, you normally think they go down. But if they're still running at you, then you don't know what to do. Some of the factors that helped is that the French found that some of the women had in their pouches some herbs that acted as a painkiller or desensitizer, similar to alcohol, which they would take before the battle, dulling the, the sense of the nerves and dulling any sense of pain. So that probably helped with shrugging off bullets, supposedly. But when they were not in combat, when they were not being police, they could do a lot of cool things. They could be singers. There were a lot of dancers. There were a lot of pottery makers. They were also farmers, although rookies would start out managing their own farm, but whenever they started to have slaves, they would have the slaves do the farm work for them. They could be musicians, and they also were textile makers in which they sold their own textile. So they had a lot of gifts outside of these combat roles. As for their battle formations, in the previous battles we talked about, they acted mostly as wing units and they preferred to fight at dawn because that's when most of the enemy army would be very sleepy, very groggy, and not at their full mental best for the fight. And they would often try and subdue the enemy, which is also what the poison tipped arrows were for. 
the poison wasn't a, a type that would automatically kill, but it would leave you temporarily paralyzed. So if you're doing a lot of slave raids, which the Mino would often engage in, they would fire a lot of these arrows to help subdue the opposing force that they were trying to capture without having to deal with much of a fight from them. And whenever fighting enemy African armies before the French decided to go all colonial on them, they would often go after enemy religious figures and items to break morale because they often tried to use psychological warfare in the middle of battle, which is why the French and the Oyo in previous encounters would do the same to the Dahomey, knowing that it would have the same effect. In the Dahomey's case, the Dahomey had a religious royal umbrella. And if that was destroyed, that would cause a loss of morale. As for the pop cultural legacy, I'm sure many of you have seen the film Black Panther and are familiar with the women in the Black Panther film called the Dora Milaje. They were based on these real Amazons. A lot of the fighting and stance poses are based on the actual spear maneuvers that the French wrote about when describing the Mino training. So as for a lot of those other things that the film did, the Dora Milaje are one of the most enduring legacy of the Dahomey Amazons. And a cool fact about them, the last real life Dahomey Mino or Dahomey Amazon died in 1973. Because when Dahomey was absolved in 1904, the Dahomey was still old enough to have lived through the kingdom and the empire falling and lived to see their independence from the French. The last Dahomey Amazon was, had been said to be a wealthy landowner by the time she died. She died with a lot of friends and family and she was happy enough to see independence, most likely. So that is a cool legacy to have, especially knowing that these women lived not too long ago. 1973 is not a long time ago, relatively speaking. If you're looking for sources, there will be a recording and I have this whole list of sources, but I have one good book to recommend if you want to know a lot about these women. It's called Amazons of Black Sparta and it's by a man called Stanley P. Alban. And it goes into all the structures of the Dahomey Mino life, which you can get more of in more than just this short presentation. But if you want to know more, if you don't feel like reading, I have created a three hour audio podcast series on YouTube, all about the entire Dahomey empire itself. Just check up, look up West African history and myths on YouTube under the YouTube channel at historian if you want to learn more about the Dahomey Empire in its entirety and more about the Amazons, and if you want to learn about other African history and myth. So it's now time for questions, just, and I would like to answer some of your questions. So as for, I'm going to answer the first question, which is what got me first interested in researching the Dahomey Kingdom and its Amazons. So I got interested because I first read about the Dora Milaje and hearing about these at the time fictional war women, I was thinking if there was a great basis. So when I was looking at the research on Black Panther, I, I heard about the Dahomey Amazons and decided to look into them further. As for the next question, which was the numbers of French casualties over the years, that is the amount of French casualties that I listed are the total casualties from the total length of the second Franco Dahomey war. So it is over the period of years. For the next question, Kimball asked, are the, were the Mino traditionally elephant hunters to begin with and how the elephant hunting tradition starts? We have no official record of how the elephant hunting tradition started. But the Mino, when they were the better huntresses, yes, they were elephant hunters to begin with. And that's how they got the attention of the, of the king, Wegbaja, at the time, because it, elephants were their scores or trophies of victory. Although the elephants would end up killing a lot of these better huntresses in the process. 
So the next question I have is, if women were so strongly represented in military forces, why could they not inherit the crown? Well, while they were rep represented strongly in the, in the military forces, it was still a heavy patriarchal society. It was still based on the bloodline of kings and male rulers. So, and these women were trained from a very young age to be completely obedient and subservient to Dahomey and to the Dahomey kingdom. So even though these women could have overpowered the men, and in fact, in one instance, the Mino actually executed one of the, one of the kings for trying to convert the Dahomey kingdom to Catholicism, most of the time they, were, they tended to be very obedient. As, as for the painkilling herbs, I wasn't able to find out the exact name. The French just described them as painkilling herbs or alcoholic herbs. So I don't exactly know the name of the plant. Were any of the Mino taken prisoner? Yes, many Mino were taken prisoner by the French, but the French also noted that the, they didn't stay prisoners for long because the Mino would often try to commit suicide because they'd rather be dead than be officially captured. As for why the colonial powers did not attempt to convince the Dahomey and Amino warriors to work with them? Well, because the Dahomey king were at the time King Lele the very, and King Benhazen, Benhazen at the, towards the end of the Dahomey empire's reign were very stubborn. They didn't want anything to do with the European powers. They didn't want to work with them towards the end because they had been seeing what had been going on with the other efforts of colonization and they did not want any of that. As for what happened to old or injured Mino, they would get to live a, a very, very well laid life. They, they got to stay on their farms, they got to be treated with honors, and even and when they died, there was always a massive funeral held in honor of the Dahomey woman that died. It, it is initially assumed that the Dahomey women were celibates. That may have been true in the, sixth, in the early days when they were just the huntresses, but as they got more and more focused in the, in the military, they were allowed to, be, to get pregnant. They were allowed to become mothers. Obviously, when they were in the middle of pregnancy, those were off the battlefield. But the idea was you want these strong women to make strong daughters so you can have a good lineage of strong women all throughout just to serve the military. As for the guerrilla tactics used to harass the opposing Oyo forces that they had, they would set a lot of traps and especially mud traps to, that the Oyo would sometimes fall into. They, they used great more deadly poison where they would hide in the forest and fire from them. So that when the Oyo would try and go into the forest to chase out the Dahomey, the Dahomey with the hunter skill would stealth away into the forest at night and use that opportunity to go to the camp because the Oyo had now been chasing after them and pour more poison, kill more of the camp guards and just keep making it a costly effort for the Oyo to even be able to maintain their presence. And the Mino forces also managed to carry large batches of those Seisei flies, which they would hurl into the Oyo camps, so which would kill a lot of the Oyo cavalry. So uh, does anyone have any more questions? Because I actually, than... this is also a very good time to let you know, there's only five minutes left of this panel. So Anyone, if you have a last couple of very quick questions, I think we'll be able to take them. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, I'm able, to, as the panel said, I'm willing and able to answer any more questions that, that you may have. And yes, you can find a lot of this in the Smithsonian Archives. If you want another look at this book, here you go, Amazons of Black Sparta. And if you want to hear more of the full podcast, just look up Afrostorian. It, Steph Ree asks me, is this in the Smithsonian Archives? Yes, this book is in the Smithsonian Archives. You can, you can actually also get a digital copy of most of the books and a lot of the other sources are also in the Smithsonian Archives. But be warned, 
half of the archives are in English, the other half are in French. I, and so I had to get both the English and French. So if you have a hard time reading French, try and see if you can get an English translation on some of the French texts. Uh, thank you, Paul O'Neill. We have just a few. Will you, will I put up the list of recommended reading in Discord? Yes, I'll pull up my entire list of recommended reading in the Discord chat for the, for, for Balticon, so that you can research it on your own and just see how many things the Dahomey and the Mino did, because there's a lot I didn't cover, like the economic structure and how they were also efficient and extremely intelligent tradeswomen. Thank you, Rene Bain. Thank you for, attend for attending. Yes, the recording of this will be posted. This is, and this will be uploaded to YouTube and to Twitch uh, much, later, much later on. I will also be posting the entirety of this on my channel, on my YouTube channel much later. Were there any, Jennifer Brain asked, were there any other examples of Africa of women only forces? Not that I personally know of. I know of many women warrior queens such as Queen Zinga of the Matamba Kingdom in Central Africa and Queen Amina of Zaria of Northern Nigeria. But I know, but those are just one woman, one woman armies. I don't know of any other women only armies in African history. Monica, yes, thank you, Mon Monica Maccabee. Yeah. So we only have two minutes. So your local library should be able to offer digital downloads of many of these resources. And the Smithsonian has made a lot of the resources free to download. So there's nothing you have to pay. And if you want to go for more in depth, you can look up JSTOR. They also give out 100 articles for free during this current coronavirus crisis. So you can also find and download some of these articles that I'll present on Discord for free. Thank you. You've been a very patient and very attentive audience. Thank you so much for the questions and thank you for attending my panel. I hope you all have a good day and enjoy the rest of Balticon.